Now let's talk about a different crime against humanity. Not as dramatic, but one that hurts billions of people. The failure to act against climate change. Specifically, we are talking about the failure of the UN Climate Summit, the COP28. The summit was to end around midday today. As usual, it's been delayed. And this happens every year. The reason for the delay was the same old problem. How do you get around 200 nations to agree on anything? especially about contentious issues like climate change. How do you get them to agree? So it's no surprise that nothing meaningful was accomplished this time either. There was no consensus on the final COP28 deal and the countries were left scrambling at the 11th hour, desperately trying to put out some sort of a statement. We'll come to that in a moment. But first, let's talk about what happened at the COP28. This climate summit saw protests, dramatic statements and dirty politics. Here are some of the highlights. Earlier today, a young Indian climate activist took to the main stage. She was given a round of applause and then kicked off stage. And she was not the only protester. A bunch of them held hands and inconvenienced some delegates. The entire summit is a hotbed for climate protests. But does it really translate into any action? I cannot hide the fact from you uh, that the text as it now stands uh, is disappointing. Perhaps until we see fire all over the world, until we see wars on our streets everywhere, perhaps we will not even, we will, we, before we probably get serious, I know that climate change is real, our backyard is burning, the frontier will soon catch up with fire. Here's what they're talking about. A draft that's been introduced, a draft COP28 deal. And this draft shows how divided our world is. It exposes the climate politics at play. Let me explain. The science of climate change is very clear. The way to stop it is to limit the use of fossil fuels. That's what experts say. How do you do that? By phasing down or phasing out the use of fossil fuels. But the draft does not talk about it. It does not mention the terms phasing down or phasing out. And this has divided countries. One side wants the draft to talk about phasing out fossil fuels. The other side doesn't want that. And this other side includes the host nation, the UAE, and the oil-producing bloc, OPEC. Listen to this. As you know, yesterday we released a text. As you also know, lots of parties felt it didn't fully address their concerns. We expected that. In fact, we wanted the text to spark conversations. And that's what's happened. It's meant to spark conversations, he says. But climate change won't wait for endless conversations and summits. You need action. And you cannot act when you don't even agree on the basics. So you have oil-producing nations on one side and the West and African nations on the other. And some of the biggest objections have come from the smallest of places, like the island nations that dot the Pacific, countries like Samoa, New and the Marshall Islands. These countries are already fighting a losing battle. Sea levels are rising and these nations are drowning. So they want much stronger action against climate change. We will not sign our gift certificate. We cannot sign on, on to text that does not have strong commitments on phasing out fossil fuels. And this is just one part of the climate divide. The other part is funding. Who will pay for climate action? Who will pay to repair the damage caused by extreme weather? Should it be the victim countries or the rich Western nations that accelerated the climate crisis in the first place? Today, the West is raising a hue and cry about fossil fuels, but over the last few centuries, they're the ones who polluted the planet for their own growth. They're happy to limit fossil fuels now, but not too keen on opening their wallets. The COP28 wants donations into a climate action fund. The fund will pay for a transition to clean energy. It will finance new green projects, also pay poorer nations for the loss and damage they suffer due to climate change. So far, countries have committed over $80 billion to this fund, which sounds like a decent amount, until you remember that the climate funding gap is about $4 trillion. So the contribution is a drop in the ocean. And there's still disagreement and acrimony and a lot of broken promises. There's really a simple reason why nations should contribute if they can. I think what we've seen over the last 
uh, what, 20 years, is there is a direct correlation between climate crisis and the movement of people. So if we wish to help people to stay where they were born and to enjoy and rejoice in the beauty of their land, we have to maintain that land with them and for them. And the honest truth is, if we don't make the global south livable, people will move because there is a thirst in humans and in humanity to stay alive. She's talking about climate refugees. Unfortunately, COP summits don't fix any of these problems. Also getting 200 odd countries to agree to anything will always be next to impossible. So why have the COP summits at all? Millions spent organizing this event, the amount of carbon emissions from people flying in on their private jets, all for non-binding pledges and statements, and no way to force anyone into action. At this rate, COP summits will be reduced to expensive photo ops, not the solution to the world's climate problems.